Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk on what are micro VMs and why should I care. My name is Richard. I'm a principal engineer at SUSE. Uh, I did work previously at MoveWorks, where I created an open source project called Liquid Metal, and that's around uh, running Kubernetes clusters in micro VMs. So what we'll be covering, um, so we're going to cover what are micro VMs first and foremost. Then we're going to cover um, how, you know, why should you care about micro VMs? And maybe you don't, uh, but you might care depending on the use cases. Then we're going to talk about how do you actually use the micro VMs. So we'll cover a couple of open source implementations. And then we were going to have a demo if we had time, but now I'm not on my laptop. We won't be able to have a demo, but if anyone's interested, uh, you know, grab me afterwards. So, lightning talk, I'm showing my age here, but we're going to be a bit like Roadrunner, and I'm going to talk quickly, so uh, apologies in advance. So, a quick show of hands. Um, who has heard of MicroVMs? Nice, cool. Has anyone used MicroVMs? One, good. Um, well, did you use uh, Firecracker Hypervisor? Yeah, yeah. yeah, cool. Well, that's, that's more than normal. So what actually are micro VMs? So I'm going to start with the word micro VM, so that that implies a lot of things. So with the first part, uh, the micro part, that, that sort of indicates something very small. Uh, and people, when people see that, that, they make certain assumptions about, you know, this thing is very, very small. And it's an adjective. So if we're talking about in English, it, you know, it's a modifier word. It, it indicates something about a noun, so the thing that follows it. So what we're saying here is the noun is the VM part. So everyone knows that is an acronym for virtual machine, so a virtualized or emulated computer system. So when we take these two things together, it's a question for everyone. Does a micro VM equal a very small uh, virtualized or emulated computer system? The word implies it. Um, and actually, the answer is not necessarily. Um, so this is where a lot of people you know, think uh, the thinking goes wrong. So this was actually pointed out to me, um, helpfully, on Twitter, uh, when I posted something about micro VMs. Whilst I don't agree with both of the comments there, I actually agree with the sentiment of the first comment. If I'm running a Kubernetes node in a micro VM, is it actually micro? Probably not. Um, but I much prefer someone else's comment that likened liquid metal to the T1000. So that, you know, that was a lot better for me. So I've said, you know, what micro VMs are not. So they're not very small, lightweight virtual machines. So what actually are they? First and foremost, if you take one thing away from this talk, it's just lightweight virtualization. That, that's all it is. And what this really means is it's a minimal, uh, minimal VMM that utilizes KVM. And when we talk about micro VM implementations, they normally focus on or prioritize three areas in their implementation. So the first is security. They want a smaller attack surface, uh, so there's less vulnerabilities. And depending on your implementation, this, this may include things like C groups, set comp filters, and, and things like that. Secondly, they're designed to be fast. Now, if you, you look into micro VMs, you'll see all sorts of numbers published. You know, this one here that, that is quoted about Firecracker, less than 125 milliseconds to launch. You know, that sounds really, really good. Um, you know, if I saw that, I'd be like, yeah, that's amazing. And that's to launch the Firecracker process. That is not to boot your guest OS. That is on top of this. So, it's, so take those numbers with a pinch of salt. But they are designed to launch hundreds of these micro VMs every second per host. And there's reasons for that. The third area they prioritize is efficiency and scalability. Now, what this really means is the resource overhead per VM should be minimal. Um, and in most implementations currently out there, this is less than five megabytes per VM. So they try and minimize that. So moving on to the devices. So what, what does this virtualization support? So it's limited. That's where this micro aspect comes into it. So it supports a limited set of devices or a limited device uh, model. 
It doesn't try to emulate all of the things and be a general virtualization solution. It's not that. It uses power virtualization. So the guests are aware that they're running within a virtual environment. Essentially, you know, depending on your implementation, there may be varying levels of, of the OI device types implemented there. But what this all means is there is less bloat, less hypervisor bloat, is how it's, it's commonly termed. It has a faster startup time. And because there are less devices supported, you know, there's, there's less uh, code in there and less attack surface, essentially. So all of the micro VM implementations have a concept of, of volumes. You have to have a root volume to boot, to boot the, uh, the micro VM. These are all implemented as um, raw file system files or block devices. And these can be really, really cumbersome to work with if you've ever had to use those. So this is where overlay file systems come in or, or dev mapper. Some implementations, some solutions that are built on top of micro VMs go so far as to take a container image, do some magic behind the scenes and present that as a block device to, to the micro VM implementation. So it sort of takes away some of the pain of dealing with those, those raw file systems. Now also, depending on your implementation, there may be no BIOS and no bootloader. The microVM implementation, such as Firecracker, will start executing the kernel directly. It will go to a magic entry point, and then it will start executing from there. So that also increases the startup time, or improves the startup time. Most implementations come with an API server built into them. And now this is a per instance API server, and it's usually accessible via socket. Now what this allows you to do is perform configuration against your micro VM. So add a you know, network interface or a volume. But it also allows you to perform operations. Now the operations that you can perform depend on the implementation you're using. So it could be start, stop your VM or take a snapshot. Also, depending on the implementation, they might have a metadata service built in. Now, this is super useful. So this allows you to place information in from the host into the metadata service and have that information available in the guest. Now, this is commonly used for things like cloud init. So you can put your cloud init from the host and, and get it to boot or use it with, during the boot process of that micro VM. Lots of other people also use it to pass in things like secrets so if, depending on your use case, you might need a secret within that guest VM. So you can use the metadata service to, to do that. Now moving on to why should you care about micro VMs? So I guess fundamentally, it allows you to do more with the same amount of tin. Um, so if we have a bare metal machine here, and I want to run a, a, a VM on there, so there's two parts to it. So there's the resources required for the guest, and then there's an overhead per VM. Now, if I'm using a micro VM implementation, the resource requirements for the guest are the same, but the overhead is less. So that basically means, you know, I can do, I can run more on that machine. And then if you think about edge and far edge, where the amount of compute is limited, this really, really makes a difference because it allows you to run more things on that machine. So some of the use cases, uh, the big one that is always uh, talked about is workload isolation. So this is essentially because you're running within a virtual machine, um, it's more isolated than a container. And now you might want to do that for regulatory, operational, or data privacy issues. So I spoke to someone that was developing a uh, data pipeline as a service solution and they wanted to allow customers to run their own custom steps. But they didn't want to expose the rest of the pipeline to that code that came from the customer, so they decided to run that individual step within a micro VM and isolate it from the rest of the process. You know, this is close to my heart, so this is what we did. We um, essentially run Kubernetes clusters, or the nodes within micro VMs, and that allows us to uh, essentially have lots lots of smaller clusters and potentially give one to every customer or one to every team instead of having you know a smaller number of large clusters 
And there are lots of other examples out there in the wild. Um, some of the most interesting ones are you know, using micro VMs to run isolated build pipelines. Um, there's a really good video of someone called uh, Alex Ellis, who's using it to run uh, GitHub runners uh, locally, uh, you know, compile kernels and stuff like that, that take forever in normal GitHub Actions runners. You can use it to create, because, because of the, the speed and the resource requirements, it's a really good solution to create in test, testing environments and preview environments on pull requests. So you can just spin up these, these environments, very lightweight. So how do you use micro VMs? So essentially there's, there's two main implementations um, uh, that I think about as micro VMs. There's Firecracker and there is Cloud Hypervisor. They both have a, s a similar heritage. So they both started out for uh, cross VM. They both use the uh, Rust VMM crate. But depending on their use cases, they have now diverged slightly. There are other solutions now. So there is the QMU Micro, but this disappeared after Firecracker and uh, Cloud Hypervisor. Both support x86 and ARM. And essentially what you have to do is create an instance of Firecracker or Cloud Hypervisor per VM. So essentially a process per VM. So if I move on to Firecracker specifically, so this was used, well this is used and developed by AWS. It underpins AWS services, so specifically Lambda and Fargate. Now what this also means is it's designed for a very specific use case in mind, which is ephemeral compute, and that drives the features that are within Firecracker. And this really translates into a reduced device model. So there is no PCI pass-through, for example. Um, there is no uh, Mac VTAP support because it's not required to run in AWS. So the, the features are driven essentially by that. What it does have, it does have a metadata service. So I can use that to, you know, do cloud in it if I want to on, on boot. But because of its ephemeral nature, it has no, no concept of pause or reboot. So, it, you know, it's just a start or a stop. So you need to be wary of that if you're going to use Firecracker. You can increase the security of the Firecracker process. You can start Firecracker via something that they call the jailer. And that essentially then forces the Firecracker process to be started uh, within a network namespace uh, using setcomp filters as well for the system calls and um, cgroup to limit the resource usage. So you can really, really lock the Firecracker process down. One thing to note is it only, you can only use it for Linux guests. Secondly, there is Cloud Hypervisor. Now this is a project started by Intel, Alibaba and a few other uh, companies. And it's a more generalized virtualization solution. And it's a bit more feature rich as a result of this. The device model it supports is, is greater than Firecracker. So it has a lot more uh, VertIO device type supported. Uh, specifically things like VDPA, if you're interested in that. It supports uh, PCI pass-through. So if you have machine learning uh, workloads you want to run in your micro VMs, great. Um, also, if you use an SRIOV as well, this is an option for you, which Firecracker is not. If you're interested in secure compute uh, and enclaves, it also supports uh, TDX and uh, SGX as well, which Firecracker doesn't. And it supports Mac VTAP out of the box. So I should caveat that Firecracker does have a feature branch open with Mac VTAP support as well. There is no metadata service in Cloud Hypervisor. So if you want to get information in and out of your guest VM, you're going to have to use something else. So you can attach a volume uh, if you want to do that. This is a, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it supports Linux and Windows uh, as guest operating systems. So there would be a demo if I was on my laptop now, but that's probably about 10 minutes. So thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay, did we have a question? Um, if anyone has questions, raise your hand. All right, perfect. 
are there any run times which are using micro VMs? Any run times as in? Uh, container run times, like if we can. Yes, yes, so you, there, there, are, there is something called uh, Firecracker Container D. Um, so you can, you can start up containers within an in individual instance. There are other companies that are doing other things with it, but not specifically container runtimes. I haven't seen that working with Kubernetes though. I've just seen that individually. Okay, I think for time. Uh